Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, who gives us great help. His presence is always near. He has servants that He sends to help us constantly. They are constantly bearing us up and aiding in ways that we wouldn't even imagine, couldn't even know they are with us. And the forces of Satan also constantly in so many ways that we might not even be aware of are touching us every day. We have great opposition, but we have great help. And we're picking back up this morning with our study on the Christian basics, those things that we do, those beliefs that we have, how exactly we work out those beliefs here and, and why we do them in the way that we do them. We are coming close to the end of that series. I think we've probably got about three more topics after this one. Uh, but this morning I want to talk about a topic that is it's really one of our shakiest areas of beliefs, I, I believe. It's, it's one of those that I don't, I think just about every Christian here would probably say, yes, I believe that. But then on the back end, it's one of the beliefs that we don't really understand and, and, and we rarely talk about. And, and this morning I want to talk about angels and demons, spiritual beings from God and from Satan. Uh, what, what are those doing? What, what, how does that impact us? I, I've never met a Christian who said, I don't believe in angels and demons. I mean, it's pretty universal. As a matter of fact, they did a poll about five years ago of Americans, not just, just Christians, but all Americans, over seven out of ten Americans believe in angels. That in our highly secular society, even at that, over 70% of Americans believe in angels. About 50% believe in demons. Christians, we, we believe in angels and demons. We're just not sure what they do. Or maybe you kind of grew up with the belief and, and the background that I had where if you had taken me through the Bible, account after account of what angels did, of what demons did, I believed every single one of them. I believe, yes, those are true. Angels did that. Yes, those are true. Demons did that. I'm just not so sure they do anything anymore. That's kind of the way I grew up. It's ancient history. Why? That's never been my experience. I see that they did those things, and I believe that they did those things. I have just never experienced anything like that. And so my belief, I think a lot of people's belief was that that's historically true, but not uh, true for present day. It doesn't accurately present what they might do uh, today for us. So, so the, the sort of questions we want to answer today is what, what are angels and demons? What do they do? Do they still do the things that they did before? And, and how does that impact us today? We're going to tackle such questions this morning. And I want to start here. I want to, I want to ask you a question. Just think about this for a second. If you were to have an experience with the supernatural today, if you actually encountered an angel, if you encountered a demon, uh, if you had an experience with the Holy Spirit, what would you expect that to look like? How would you know? And, and say, yes, that was a supernatural experience as opposed to other natural experiences that do not evolve, involve angels, demons, the Holy Spirit. And, and what would you expect it to be like? And I think this is a good starting point because if the problem that we often have is with our experiences, I don't experience them, um, we maybe need to ask the question, well, what do I expect an experience to be like? Such that I could point at it and say, yes, I know that was a supernatural experience. That's what I'm talking about that I either have had or have not had. What we'd expect, what we would expect uh, something like that to be like. Biblically, if you want to look at the Bible, uh, they, they come in all different shapes and sizes. Encounters with the supernatural. They come in all different shapes and sizes. We, we do gravitate towards the ones. We tend to remember the ones that grab our attention. The ones that are definitely out of this world, otherworldly. Uh, Luke chapter 2, you remember when the angels came into that shepherd's field in the same region. They were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over the flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. Before it's all over, you know the story that the heavenly host are praising God out there in that field. That's pretty obvious. If you were there, you would say, I know, I experienced something supernatural. 
Uh, Genesis 3, Adam and Eve are driven out from the Garden of Eden. And it says that God assigned a guard there at the Tree of Life so they couldn't come back and keep eating from that tree. It was a cherubim with a flaming sword. I mean, it's, it's like a lightsaber. You would remember that. I, I, I just I wonder, you know, if, if Adam and Eve ever kind of walked back that way and there he is still standing there with his flaming sword. I wonder what that would have been like. You would have known that's obviously an encounter with the supernatural. But it's not always flashing lights. It's not always fire in the Bible. Uh, Hebrews 13 says this. He says, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Unawares. So, so this angel that so many times in the Bible people encounter an angel and they just fall to the ground. It's just gripped with fear, light, can't believe what's happening right now. That same being, you might actually also have an encounter with that angel and have no idea. Completely unaware. You're telling me I could have the same experience, the same interaction, but not be aware of it at all. And apparently that is the case. Uh, there's another uh, famous interaction that, that we read about in the book of Luke. It says that Jesus rose from the dead. I mean, resurrected spiritual body. He has come through death. He didn't just come back from the dead. He went through death and came out on the other side. And he walks with these two disciples. It seems like for like half a day. They're walking, they're talking, they say, hey, come eat with us. He comes and sits down at their table. They're eating together. They spend like half a day with the risen Jesus, completely unawares. Had no idea who it was until their eyes were open. So, it could be, what's an experience with the supernatural like? Well, it could be something where the sky is ripping open. It could be something like you're helping somebody at Walmart get something off the top shelf and completely unaware that's a messenger from heaven. Could be one or the other. A third option, what this experience might be like, uh, it could completely take place in your subconscious. Could bypass your senses altogether. Matthew 1 and verse 20 says, An angel of the Lord came to Joseph and spoke with him in a dream. In a dream. He did not see the angel with his eyes or hear the angel with his ears or touch or taste or feel the angel completely bypassed his senses, the angel communicated directly to his mind. The forces of God may do this. The forces of evil also. Acts 5 and verse 3. Peter is speaking with Ananias who has just tried to deceive the disciples with a, with a gift that is not all that it seems to be. Peter says, Acts 5 and 3, Satan filled your heart to lie. Ananias did not see, hear, touch, feel, or taste Satan. And yet Satan impacted his heart all the same. He filled his heart to lie. So, it is the case that supernatural beings may directly communicate to you in your mind. So, what, what would an experience with the supernatural be like? Well, we got like three options here. Number one, you can see some, you can experience something where you walk away saying, that was definitely supernatural. You could have another experience where you walk away not thinking anything about it at all. It was so mundane. It's just so every day. You don't even realize you have experienced the supernatural unawares. And then there's a third option where they might impact, communicate, interact with you in the realm of your mind. Certain thoughts that you think, certain ideas that come to mind. Have you ever wondered, did that originate with me? Did I come up with that thought? Did I truly have that idea or was that an idea given to me from somewhere else? Uh, C.S. Lewis wrote this satirical book about demons. It's probably one of his best works. It's, um, it's written in the form of a series of letters. A series of letters from a, a supervising demon, we could say, to a, another demon who's out there tempting in the field. He has a patient, he calls him, that he's trying to, to lead to hell. And so this supervising demon is just writing letter after letter to this junior tempter uh, trying to guide him in his work. And uh, the, 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 it's, it's all satire. C.S. Lewis has this way of putting these profound truths in the, the package of light and, and airy conversation, but it's heavy stuff nonetheless. 
And, and there's this one exchange where the demon is talking about an experience he once had. He's trying to lead this man to hell. This man is an atheist. And I want you to read uh, from the point of view of this demon. This is imaginative, but I think it's pretty dead on imagination how this might could go. This is, this is the demon speaking, so uh, everything's turned backwards. If he talks about the enemy, that's God, because God is his enemy. So listen to the way that this demon talks about his patient. He said, I saw a train of thought in his mind beginning to go the wrong way. The enemy, of course, was at his elbow in a moment. Before I knew where I was, I saw my 20 years' work beginning to totter. But I was not a fool. I struck instantly at the part of the man which I had best under my control and suggested that it was just about time he had some lunch. The enemy presumably made the counter-suggestion that this was more important than lunch. At least I think that must have been his line for when I said, quite. In fact, in fact too important to tackle at the end of a morning. The patient brightened up considerably. And by the time I had added, much better come back after lunch and go into it with a fresh mind, he was already halfway to the door. Once he was in the street, the battle was won. I showed him the newsboy shouting the midday paper and a number 73 bus going past. And whenever he reached the bottom of the steps, I had got into him an unalterable conviction that whatever odd ideas might come into a man's head when he was shut up alone with his books, a healthy dose of real life was enough to show him that all that sort of thing just couldn't be true. It's a battle for our mind. What we need to realize is that there is a war going on right now, a war for the soul of every man, woman, and child on earth. And it's not just snarling goblins. It's not, <coughs> it's not these little red men with pitchforks. You, you've seen that characterization. It's not people with their eyes rolling in the back of their head. It's that thought you had that helps you to rationalize the sin that you weren't really quite ready to get rid of yet. It, it's that, that calling that's placed on your heart to press more into the presence of God and, and to seek Him and to worship Him. But it's that distracting thought that comes along and shows you the bus or the Facebook feed or whatever to distract you from the things of God. And off you go, floating away from God again. Elisha prayed that his, his servant might have his eyes opened, that he might see what's really going on all around him. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around. He saw the spiritual reality that surrounded him. The question this morning is, do you see the spiritual war surrounding you? Do you see? Do you see what they do with our thought life and the way that they influence us? Paul says in Ephesians 6 and 12, he says, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. The spiritual forces of evil are real, and they impact us every single day. But we do not despair because the spiritual forces of God, of righteousness, which are for us, they are real and they impact us every single day. Psalm 91, we just read it again. We don't need to forget this is a promise. This is a, for, a promise. He, he says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. For He will command His angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. The spiritual forces of God are real and they strengthen us every single day. Hebrews 1, he says, Are they not ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Whether we perceive it or not, we are influenced by these forces every single day. Attacked on one side, helped on the other. Pulled towards darkness on one side and pulled towards the light on the other. And the first thing that we need to be aware of is that the primary battlefield is right here between our ears. Where they work, where they do their most work is in our thought life. John 8 and 44, Jesus says that Satan, the devil, is the father of lies. That he has no truth in him. That, that lies just come out of, they just flow out of him according to his natural character. Because his character is deceit. It is lies. 2 Corinthians 11 and 14 and 15, Paul says that, that, that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. And his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. 
Their primary work is deceit. Deceiving and lying. Deceiving and lying. That is the primary work of Satan and his angels and his demons. But by contrast, the primary work of God's angels is to be messengers of the truth. The, the word angel literally means messenger. That's, that's how it translates literally. They are messengers of the truth. Revelation 22 and 6, the angel says to John, These words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent His angel to show His servants what, what must soon take place. He sent, he sent me to give you a true and trustworthy message so that you would know the truth. Satan is trying to pull you towards deceit and lies, but God has sent His angel to show you a trustworthy and a true message. They testify to God's truth. That's, that's what angels do primarily. So the primary battlefield is, is right here. The question is, am I going to believe God's truth or am I going to believe lies? That's, that's spiritual warfare in a nutshell. Am I going to believe God's truth or am I going to believe lies? 2 Corinthians 10, Paul says it this way, beginning in verse 3. He says, For though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Paul says Satan is working to establish these strongholds in us. Our spiritual warfare, it is to destroy these strongholds. But he tries to set up these strongholds in our hearts. And, and what is a stronghold? It's these lies that kind of implant deep into us and we believe them. And they become our truth because we believe them so, so much over and over and over again. We just reiterate that this is true. I've never really been a smart person, and, and I don't think I ever will. It becomes my truth. It's a lie. It's a stronghold that Satan has sunk into my heart. I know this relationship isn't the best for me, but you know I, I really don't think I can expect anything better. I know I shouldn't drink so much, but it's not hurting anybody, and, and I don't have a problem. I know that I can't ever forgive him or forgive her. I know I will never be whole again. I'm too broken. I do not have value. I'm unworthy. These lies become strongholds. And what Satan does, he, he just kind of broadcasts them. He throws these lies at us day after day after day. And if one ever sticks, he starts right there building a stronghold, building a lie that takes root in our heart. And Paul says the battle is reclaiming our minds and our hearts with God's truth. We destroy these strongholds. We destroy lofty opinions and arguments that raise themselves up against God's knowledge. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ. Jesus, I believe you. Jesus, I will believe your truth. What you say about me is true, and I will believe it. I believe what you say I ought to do, and I'll believe that I can do it because of your power living in me. That is the essence of this warfare. You know, I'm not much for the little red cartoon guy, but, but I think if there's one cartoon that kind of gets close to the truth, you've seen the one with the, the demon on one shoulder and the angel on the other shoulder, and they're both kind of trying to pull them this way and that way. Uh, yeah, it's not the little red guy, but the truth is, every single one of us, there, there is a demon whispering in that ear, trying to pull me into darkness. But there is God's messenger bringing the truth, saying, haven't you believed that lie long enough? Isn't it time to turn back to the truth? Isn't it time to get rid of that stronghold? That's the truth. That's what we're talking about in spiritual warfare. You need to know that spiritual warfare th starts with your thought life, but then it goes. It, it travels. It, it goes other places because it's not just about your thought life. Your thought life impacts others, and other people's thought life impacts you. Think about how many millions of people were impacted by Hitler's thought life. H how many millions of people were impacted by Mother Teresa's thought life. The battle is for my thought life, but then the battle goes way out beyond me. It's more than just about me. I remember when we moved up to Fayette, the, just the year before we moved up to Fayette, I read this book 
uh, and it was, it was one of the best books I've ever read. If, if you're looking for something to put on your reading list, uh, I've got it right here. It's, it's the, uh, the Insanity of God is the name of this book. This is an, an incredible book. It's written by a, a guy that we don't even know his name. It says the author is Nick Ripkin. That's just a pseudonym. The thing is he goes into so many persecuted areas to use his real name would be dangerous for himself and for others. But he started out his work doing aid in Somalia. As a matter of fact, the movie Black Hawk Down, that was just around the corner from where he was back in the 90s. But he felt like he failed in Somalia. He said, there's less Christians when I left than when we got there. So he went on this campaign of trying to interview Christians in persecuted countries. How are you doing the faith where you are? I want to learn from you. And he went from country to country interviewing Christians in China, Eastern Europe, and all these kind of places. He tells this story towards the end of the book, how he's got this tour, this interviewing tour that's really packed. But he gets this email from a European doctor that's working in a Muslim-dominated country. He won't name it. Uh, but the doctor says, uh, I really think God needs you to come down here where we are. And he says, I, was, I wasn't trying to be offensive or anything. I was very cordial, but I said, look, I, my, my schedule is tight, and, and I will be in your area uh, sometime later next year. It's on the schedule already. And he said he went on to do whatever trip he had scheduled next, but the next time he got to a place where he could get his email, he had another email. And the email said, I think the Lord wants you to come right now. <laughs> and so he, you know, of course, kind of, he fires back something a little less gracious. I'm sorry, but I will not be coming uh, to, to your country this year. And he goes off and he does something else. Gets back to his email. He's got another email. And the doctor is more insistent. And this time he's more insistent. He's, he's pretty harsh this time. Stop asking me to come. I'm not coming. But then his next trip, something happens. He, he gets a call just before he's about to leave. And uh, his contact says, I'm so sorry, but you're about to interview 18 pastors here in this country. They're all in jail. So unless you want to stay a lot longer than you had planned to stay, um, just, just don't come. So he has that trip canceled. Uh, the guy sends him another email. He's, he's just like brushing them off at this point. He starts to go on his next trip. And his contact calls him again. He says, you know, you, you were supposed to interview all these different pastors. Well, some of them were in an automobile crash. Some of them are sick in the hospital. Some of them are under tight surveillance. It's not the best time for you to go. And about that time he gets another email. And this time he answers back and says, you know what, I, I've got some time. So, okay, fine, I'm, I'm, I'm coming. Gets down there. And it's one of these deals where you get on one plane to go change to a smaller plane. By the time you finally get there, you're on a little prop plane out in the middle of nowhere, dirt airstrip, not a place where planes are always taken off. I mean, you go pick somebody off up there on appointment. You know when they're going to land, um, but, but hardly, ever, hardly anybody's ever using this place. So when he gets there, he's, he's a little surprised to see there is a car with a white man who he assumes to be his European doctor contact. But then there's also five men in Muslim dress kind of off to the side from him. And so he, he walks up and he you know, is greeted by the, the European doctor and kind of in passing he said, oh, and who are your friends here? And the doctor says, you don't know these guys? <laughs> he says, no. And the doctor says, well, if you don't know these guys and I don't know these guys, then we might have a security problem. Here's my cell phone number. If it turns out okay, I'll pick you up later. And the doctor just leaves. And so he's here in the middle of nowhere at this dirt airstrip with these five men who, who appear to be Muslims and know where to go. And so he's trying, I mean, how do I get out of this situation? He's had enough experience to know how to be careful on the foreign mission field. This is not good. So he starts kind of trying to walk back over maybe to see if he can get a ticket out of there. And the guys are, are following him, like right behind him. And they're, they're tugging on his, on his shirt, trying to get him to turn around. He thinks he's about to be dead. And finally, in broken English, one of them says, Stop. Please, please stop. We follow Jesus. We follow Jesus. And by some miracle of persuasion, they finally get him to go with them to a remote apartment in this nearby city in the middle of nowhere in a Muslim-dominated country. 
And he's nervous as all get out, but he's trying to, hey, if this is God, this is God. And, and they're just kind of looking at him. And so he starts talking about, well, I, I guess I'm here because, and he says some things, and they all start laughing at him. And I, I want to read you how this, how this exchange ends, but it's, it's quite incredible. He says, they shook their heads, smiled, and said to me, you may think you know why you've come here, but we would like to tell you why you're really here. They briefly sketched their own personal stories. They each had dreams or visions that had raised spiritual questions and prompted a long search for answers. They had each miraculously found a copy of the Bible to study. And after reading through the entire book several times, they had each on their own decided to follow Jesus. They had each been rejected and disowned by their families. Eventually they had to flee their country. They made their way across the border to this small border town. Somehow they had found each other and they realized that they had all shared the same newfound faith in Christ. They didn't really know what to do next. But they instinctively started meeting in this tiny third floor apartment. They met daily from midnight until three in the morning, hoping that no one would notice them. They read the Word of God secretly and tried to provide spiritual support and encouragement for one another. Two months earlier, they explained they had started praying this prayer, Oh God, we don't know how to do this. We grew up and were trained as Muslims. We know how to be Muslims in a Muslim environment. We even know how to be communists in a Muslim environment. But we do not know how to follow Jesus in a Muslim environment. Please, Lord, send us someone. Send us someone who knows about persecution. Someone who knows what other believers are doing. Someone who can encourage and teach us. Chills were running up and down my spine as they explained what had happened when they had been together in this same rented upper room earlier that very day. At 1.30 this morning we were here praying when the Holy Spirit told us to go to the airport. The Holy Spirit told us that we were to go to the first white man who got off the plane. The Holy Spirit told us that He was sending this man to answer our questions. So they said as they smiled at me again, that is why you're here. Now you can do what God has called you here to do. But before you start teaching us, however, we have one more question for you. Where have you been and what have you been doing for these last two months? He's been saying no. That's what he's been doing. He said, I repented to them and asked them to forgive me for saying no. Could it be that at this very moment, God is desperately trying to get your attention, calling to you to believe His truth, to, to change your thought life, because somebody somewhere is begging Him for help. Could it be? Could it be that at this very moment, Satan has a demon doing everything that it can to distract you from that calling, to, to lie to you and to deceive you and turn you a different way because it would rather have more company in hell? This is, this is real. This is the battle that, that's all around us. This is, this is the spiritual warfare that touches you and touches me every single day. It's nothing to be afraid of. This is not Halloween. This is not spooky. He who is with us is greater than he who is in the world. We are winning this war. But it is certainly calls to be sober-minded and to be vigilant because souls hang in the balance. This is real. This is a war. What we do matters. How we respond matters. And all God calls us to do is very simple. Samuel prayed this simple prayer, Speak, Lord, your servant hears. I'm ready to hear your truth. I'm ready to receive your truth. Whatever you have to say to me, I'm listening to you, and I'm ready to act on that truth. Very simple. That is what is required of us in this spiritual warfare. Will we just commit to that simple daily prayer? Speak, Lord, your servant hears. Commit to hear the truth, to invite the truth. Lord, I want to hear your truth. Matter of fact, I don't just want to hear your truth. I want you to show me the lies. If there's some stronghold, it's something that's set up in my heart where I'm believing something that is absolutely not true because Satan planted that stronghold, I want you to show it to me. I want you to destroy it with your truth. Psalm 139, 23 and 24, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. This is a fearless prayer of stronghold demolition. Holy Spirit, come in, look around, see if you find something false, and then lead me in the better path. Lead me in the truth. And maybe toughest of all, 
Would you commit to cling on to this prayer in the dark moments? You know those. We don't talk about these moments. But those moments where the, the temptation is so strong, I don't know how I could possibly get away from this lie that I'm being sold. I don't know how to go any other way than this way. Will you pray even in those dark moments? Speak, Lord, your servant hears. At that very moment, his angels are serving you, strengthening you. He is sending a great help. If you would please pray with me. Father God, we love you and we look to you for great help, knowing that you do send great help. Father, we are aware that Satan is sending a great attack upon our minds each and every day, pulling us into lies. Lies of hurt, lies of bitterness, lies of unforgiveness, lies of devaluing ourselves and devaluing others. Lies about our purpose, either that we have no purpose or that our purpose is self-centered, self-seeking, pleasure-driven, worldly-driven. Father, we know that the truth is that we were created with great value, with your image stamped upon each and every one of us for great purposes. Father, we pray that you would guide us and lead us in your truth. Father, I pray that you would make us listeners and hearers, people who are ready to hear a word from you ready to move upon your truth, that you would free us from the shackles of, of sin and, and absent-mindedness, distraction, all these tools that Satan uses against us. We know that he has been doing what he does for a very long time. He is very skilled. He is a terrible adversary. Father, we know that you are greater. We know that He cannot stand against you. If we simply hold on to your truth, there is nothing more than He can do. He has nothing, only deceit, only lies. He has killed many, many with those lies. But Father, we, we pray that we would not be among them, that we would be those who shine truth, not only for our own well-being, but for the well-being of everyone around us, that we would shine truth, that others would see you, and be saved. Father, we, we pray that you would come quickly. We pray, we, we pray that you would make an end of this evil assault that comes on us, that comes upon our nation, comes upon our families, comes upon our community. Father, we pray that, that you would grow and swell your kingdom and that your kingdom would defeat this evil assault. Father, we pray now as a family together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.